Hello, I'm Olivia Mattis, and I'm delighted to welcome you today on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation to another one of our Sunday programs on subjects of rescue and resistance during the Holocaust. Today, we are focusing on the period right after World War II, the re-entry into life. And this is such an interesting uh, part of history that is not enough focused on. And I'm so grateful to our filmmaker, Oshwa Schwartz Rehm, for shining a spotlight on this hero who came right after the war and on the immense um, impact that she had on these poor children, these Holocaust survivor orphan children that Lena Kukler Zilberman found in Krakow. Now, our story takes place partly in Poland, but also in Israel. And our thoughts, of course, are with the people in Israel. We do have a panelist in Israel, and that is our filmmaker. And just before today's program, there was a bombing raid right where she is. So we're glad she's safe. We're glad she's here. Today, we have a moderator, and that is Professor Shulamit Reinhartz of Brandeis University, recently retired. And the third speaker that I have not yet mentioned is my own mother, Dr. Noemi Mattis, who's a psychologist. But I'll leave it to Shulamit to introduce our speakers. Shulamit, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Shulamit Reinhartz. If that's difficult, you can call me Shula. And I will be your moderator in our discussion about Lena Kuchler Silberman, who lived from 1910 to 1987 the bulk of the 20th century. In these days and weeks of horror for Israel and Jews around the world, I am really grateful for the opportunity to participate in a discussion of the extraordinary Lena Kuchler who understood the healing power of love. I believe we need Lena today, just as we needed her after the Shoah and in the early years of the State of Israel. The heart-wrenching film we watched depicting Lena's rescue of Jewish children shows how Polish Jewish orphans had to deal with anti-Semitism even after the war. But, but the film also offers a heartwarming um, story depicting not just the, what was terrible, but what was positive. And that is depicting Lena's ability to help and heal them. It's remarkable that human beings, little, little children who don't yet have defenses and don't have their parents around could actually heal. We have two excellent speakers today. Our first is Dr. Noemi Perlman Mattis, a retired psychologist who lives in Salt Lake City of all places, Utah. Um, I'm not prejudiced against it, it's just surprising. Um, Dr. Mattis's career has focused on treating adult survivors of childhood trauma. What you should understand from that is maybe T PTSD or some other concept. How did children who have trauma become adults? Did they live with the trauma forever or were psychologists able to help them? Noemi brings to this topic her academic training and clinical experience, as well as her personal knowledge. Um, and this personal knowledge comes from the fact that she herself was a hidden child in Brussels during the Shoah. So she could really empathize with people who had trauma as children. Naomi's parents were Jewish rescuers of Jews. Let me say that again. Naomi's parents, Naomi's parents were Jewish rescuers of Jews, a rare thing, and established several orphanages herself. That is also part of her experience. Because Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial and Research Center in Israel, honors only Gentiles, as righteous Gentiles, the B'nai B'rith World Center in Jerusalem started a program in 2011 to honor Jews who saved Jews. 
Noemi's parents are two of the recipients to date. Our second speaker is Oshra schwartz Rehm, filmmaker, film director, and expert on Israeli film. Oshra has a wealth of knowledge about Lena Kuchler Silberman beyond what she incorporated into the film. She could probably speak to us for hours. And she will share some of that knowledge just a bit with us today, along with relevant slides. Oshra is calling from Israel as uh, Olivia Mattis told us, where she lives and teaches. In fact, she just got out of her classroom to come to us. We send you our best wishes, Oshra, as you deal with life during the war of Israel against Hamas and the existential crisis it represents for Israel and all Jews. A few words about Lena. In my view, everyone who helped European Jews during and after the Shoah is a heroine or hero. But I consider Lena special among them for many reasons. She was single. She was a woman. She was a Jew. She rescued children on her own. Furthermore, Lena took care of so many children, not just a few, children whose ages ranged from toddlers to teenagers. Lena is special because she took care of these children for such a long time eventually bringing them to Israel after the state was founded in 1948. And then she let them live on their own when they were ready and she stepped somewhat aside. Very few heroes step aside. It was only in 1957 at age 47 when she knew that the children were doing well that she married and gave birth to her daughter, Shira. Lena rescued the children physically. She also educated them intellectually, emotionally, morally, as members of a group and as Jews. And now let's hear from our first expert, Dr. Noemi Perelman Mattis. Good afternoon. My only knowledge of Lena comes from Oshra's beautiful movie. Much of the movie addresses Lena's healing work with the children. And that is what I intend to focus on since I'm a psychologist. I believe that it is the first time that the Sousa Mendes Foundation celebrates a war hero whose major contribution came after the war. It is appropriate because trauma has a long wake. Even if you're lucky to encounter an inspired healer, the journey to recovery is a long and arduous one. I was struck with Lena's approach, which was way ahead of her time. In the years after the war, professionals did not speak about trauma as a source of dysfunction. Even 20 years later, when I was a PhD student at Columbia University, I never even heard the word trauma. When I sought my own therapy, I met with three psychologists, all Jewish. I mentioned that I had been a hidden child. No one ever asked me about it, and I didn't volunteer. But Lena focused on the trauma. She started her interaction with each child with the words, tell me your story. We now know that each retelling of the trauma story to a supportive listener makes it more bearable. Most cultural traditions understand that. In the Jewish culture, we sit Shiva after bereavement, and we begin to heal as we tell the story to each visitor over and over again. It is hard to really listen to trauma stories. It takes courage. At the present time, we are all affected by the events in Israel and Gaza. Some of us would rather look away and the news programs gave us trigger warnings. Lena had the courage to listen and share in the child's pain. We know that she herself had suffered great losses. It may be that she found healing in the sharing. As I prepared this talk, I thought of my own mother, Fela Perelman, Olivia's grandmother. 
During the war, she had worked in Belgium to find hiding places for Jewish children. After the liberation, she established homes for the Jewish orphans. She was inspired to hire young people returning from concentration camps as counselors. Trauma survivors understand one another. They speak the same language. The counselors and the children could heal together. They created a new family. Oshra's movie highlights Lena's approach with acting out and difficult teenagers. Those are kids who have seen awful things. They have mostly encountered two kinds of people, victims and perpetrators. Those were their only role models. The victims are weak, the perpetrators are strong and strong feels better. It makes sense to emulate the perpetrators. Lena did not berate the children. A less intuitive therapist might have doled out punishments or at least remonstrations. In normal circumstances, it could be good pedagogy to emphasize consequences for unacceptable behavior, but Lena remained warm and supportive. She understood that those kids had just lived with constant fear. Fear and anger have the same chemistry. Flight, flight or fight are two responses to extreme danger. The children would only overcome their hostility if they felt safe, really safe. They did feel safe with Lena's warmth and non-judgmental approach. Some years ago, I had a cleaning woman, let's call her Mary, who was fostering her little niece, let's call her Joni. Joni had suffered abuse by her alcoholic mother and a succession of unsavory boyfriends. Oh. Joni was a lovely child, but she had episodes of rage where she screamed, kicked people, and broke things. Mary and her social worker partner would punish her with disapproval and isolation, otherwise known as time out. Mary often brought Joni to her house, and I once witnessed one of the child's outbursts. I said to Mary, tell her that she's safe, that you will not send her back to her mother. Reassure her, give her a hug. Joni instantly calmed down. She soon exhibited no more of these outbursts. Lena's approach to her acting out boys may seem surprising, but it was exactly right. Lena also modeled a different behavior as she was both kind and strong. We see in the movie that the children turn out to be thoughtful adults. Thank you, Ortra, for introducing us to Lena. She is an inspiration. Thank you, Noemi. It was so inspiring what you said. It was fascinating and inspiring for me to hear your, your comments on Lena. First, I have to apologize that my English is very Israeli and my accent is, <laughs> is too very Israeli. So I, I will try my best um, to be coherent. And uh, if I'm not, please excuse me. Uh, I would like to start with telling you a little bit uh, about how I came to make the film. Um, well, as a teenager, I read Lena's books. She published a few books, but I learned, I read Lena books a few times because uh, when I was growing up, my 100 children, the, the book that Lena published in 1949 was a huge, huge, huge uh, bestseller. Everybody read it. And it was very influential uh, on my generation. Uh, you have to understand that there were very few books about the Holocaust, and the Holocaust was like a dark story that nobody spoke about. We knew it happened. We saw survivors everywhere. My parents were not survivors, but uh, most of my um, colleagues and my friends, my schoolmates, 
were children of survivors, but we never knew their stories. It was unspoken. So we looked for books. We looked for some information. And uh, except for uh, Anne Frank's uh, diary, there were not many books available. So when this book, uh, we started to read this book, we couldn't stop. And one of the reasons the book was so successful was this optimistic point of view. The fact that it dealt with coming back to life. There were some horrible stories there, but they were minor, you may say so. Uh, the emphasis was not on the uh, back, background trauma of the children, uh, but uh, of, the, of the way that Lena actually rehabilitated them. And I have to say that uh, like half of the book by Juan Adotillo tells the story of Lena, uh, how she survived the war. Uh, she was a member of the underground. She lived in Warsaw Ghetto. She lost most of her family. And she was also such a strong woman. The way she survived was such a role model for all of us. And uh, it was an opportunity to learn about the Holocaust, but not to break break out of it, break down from it. So um, Amalia Morgolin, my good friend and colleague, um, and I made a TV drama just before we made this film, and we really like to work together. Amalia, unfortunately, passed away six or seven years ago. And we decided to make a documentary. At that time, it was just at the, the end of the previous millennium, 1999. Uh, we thought that it was really crucial to interview children survivors of the Holocaust. It was the time to interview the, the children survivors mm -hmm. because the stories of uh, the older people were already heard, but nobody talked to the children. And we decided to do it. And the first story that came to my mind was Lena's story. Remember that the last pages of the book, Lena says that she uh, brought the children to Kutzat Schiller, which is a kibbutz uh, just south of Tel Aviv, that far from Rehovot, if, if anybody knows where the, the Weizmann Institute. Um, it's a kibbutz just outside the city. And uh, she brought the children there. Um, and we, I mean, the younger children, and we decided to call the kibbutz and ask if there are still Lena's children there. They told us, yes, there are still five of Lena's children in the kibbutz. You're welcome to come and talk to them. So the next Saturday, we just drove to the kibbutz and the first woman that we interviewed was uh, Lea Reved. Lea Reved was about 12 when she survived. And uh, we sat in a very tiny kibbutz living room with her husband sitting on the back. And uh, she said, what I'm going to tell you now, I never told anyone except for Lena. I told Lena at the orphanage, but since then, I never told this story because when we came to Israel, nobody wanted to hear these stories. And we wanted to come out of this Holocaust and be normal and forget it. So my husband here never heard it. My children don't know nothing about my story. And the only reason that I'm going to open this Pandora box is because of Lena, because I want the story of Lena who, who saved us all to be told. And she started to talk. And of course, it was a horrible story, a story of abandonment, how a child is being abandoned by his parents. This is how they experience. They, as adults, they know that the parents try to save them, but as children, they, the most horrible uh, trauma was the abandonment. And um, after 
Leah, we heard another story and another story, and they were all, all of them were really horrible stories. And in all of the story was, were horrible stories of trauma and abandonment. We came back home. We had, I still had young children at home when, in 1999, and Amalia as well. And we hugged our children. We were really felt shaken and um, terrified. The first thought was, what did we think of doing such a thing? We are not social workers or psychologists. We never talk to post-traumatic people. This is such a big responsibility and we are not, we don't have a credentials to do it. How can we do it? We are really terrified. But the second thought was, there is no way back actually, because once they told us the story, once they gave us this hidden treasure, we had to tell it, we had to make the film. So this is the beginning of the journey of making the film, a journey that took four years, four years of research, of traveling, not only in Israel, but in other countries, in America, in France, and in other places. The first day, uh, picture that you see is actually the first photo of the children after they escaped from Poland, from communist Poland in 1946. Uh, you probably remember the heroic story like Sound of Music, how Lena took out the children um, in a very, very big uh, risk, personal risk. Um, and they are in the main square of the old city of Prague. It's a very famous statue behind uh, the bus. The children came out of the bus. Some of them remained inside, but most of the children came out of the bus and uh, smiling because it's the first feeling of being free, the first time they felt free. Uh, what you see uh, below the picture is Lena's inscription in her handwriting and you see the translation uh, here and for me it's like a voice from the past when I touch this inscription I feel that I somehow I can touch Lena because when we started making the film Lena was no longer alive she passed in 1987 when she was 77 uh, so we never met her, and she is my biggest hero. Um, you can, oh, here it is. We use this photo for the film poster, one of the film posters. And you can see fifth from the right, you can see Lena. There's a child waving his hand um, behind her. Yeah, you can see the point. <laughs> And as you can see, she was really tiny. She was the height of the children. And she was quite small, but very authoritative and very, very strong woman. She was like this, um, she's a tiny figure, but she was bigger than life. Uh, when we, at the end of the film, if you remember, we made a reunion of the children at the kibbutz at Kvutza Chiller. Um, around 55 of the children came and we printed this photo on a huge perplex uh, board uh, and the children wrote their names, if you remember, they're, they're writing their names uh, on the photo. The big pers perspex board is in um, um, the Museum of the Ghetto Fighters in Acre in Israel where most of Lena's archive is, is. If you happen to go there, you can see a lot of Lena's archive um, in that museum. You can move on to the next. Uh, what you see in the, in the photo is still in Poland, in Zakopane. Lena is feed, feeding a child. 
This is not a posing to the camera. It was a day-to-day -day work. And although Lena was the headmistress of the orphanage, and she dealt with all the big stuff, like finding funds and all these amazing things that she did to keep this orphanage. She also had a very, very intimate relationship with each one of the children. Uh, and they felt that she was their mother. Uh, they felt that this woman actually uh, had a very, very um, private, and a personal relationship with each one of them. And I think you can feel it in the film when they talk about her. They don't talk about this woman who saved them. They talk about this woman that when she died, they felt, they felt orphans the first time because when their birth parents died, it was, as Edith says in the film, it was like everybody was like this. It wasn't a thing, but when Lena died, they really felt orphans before the first time. I want to tell you one of the stories. Uh, I think I don't have time anymore. Time is it's really going very fast, but I'll say it very quickly. The story of Yossi. Yossi is the man who doesn't know his identity. His identity is lost. And um, Maybe we can show the next uh, the next slide already. In this photo, you can see Lena holding a child who looks quite Jewish. This child is Isaac. Isaac is not in the film. Yossi, in the right, is actually one of the heroes of the film. But when they were taken out of the monastery, they were always together, lean up, uh, one. Uh, on the other. They were like siblings. Uh, one of them looked Jewish and the other one didn't. And nobody knows if he was or wasn't because they were rescued out of bombed Warsaw with no papers and nothing. So Lena wanted to keep them together and she looked for adopting parents because she thought that raising children in orphanages is not very good. It's not healthy. So she looked for adopting parents and there were people, uh, couples, childless couples who came to the orphanage and looked for survi children survivors. And some of them were adopted. And this woman came from America, a very rich woman, I'm not going to say whom, a very rich family. And they wanted to adopt a Jewish child. Isaac was circumcised and Yossi not. And they only wanted Isaac. They didn't want to take Yossi. And Lena tried to persuade them for months to take both children. She said they were not going to survive the separation. And it didn't work. They only adopted Isaac and the adoption failed. And this raises one of the biggest questions you can, you may go on. If this is, we took out, it's, it's a name. Um, a zooming of the same picture of Lena holding Isaac. It was the book cover, the reissue of the cover. In 2003, we used this photo as the book cover. In we change the photo. The biggest question that comes out of the film and even in the book, in Lena's book, are these bones can come alive? The, the question that she asked when, they see, when she see, sees the children the first time. Is this pa even possible to rehabilitate children with such trauma? Is it even possible to raise them to be normal people and productive people in society? For most of them, it worked, but not for all of them. And um, here you see, in, we can go to the last photo <laughs> because my time is over. And the last photo shows Lena coming to visit the children in the kibbutz. You see Yossi as a 10 year old, maybe, or 11 year old, already growing up at the kibbutz with his friends. Everything looks normal. Everything on the surface, they seem happy. 
But are they really happy? This is a question that we must ask ourselves over and over again. Thank you. Thank you, Oshra. So we will get to audience questions in a few minutes. So I do encourage all of our audience members to put your questions into the chat box. I'm sure that there are a lot of things that you would like to ask. I know I certainly have many questions myself. Right now, uh, let me take this opportunity to tell you about what we have upcoming at the Susa Mendes Foundation. So this is the perfect time to be writing those questions in the chat box. So we have three more programs in 2023. We have programs the next couple of weeks, then we take a break for Thanksgiving, and then we, we reconvene in the beginning of December. Next week, we're showing a film called Among the Righteous, um, Stories of the Holocaust in Arab Lands. And that is the story of how many people don't know that the Holocaust actually extended into North Africa, that there were four North African countries where there were concentration camps. And there were members of the local population who actually rescued these Jews from Nazi concentration camps in North Africa. It's quite an astounding history. And we'll have the world's expert on this history, Dr. Robert Satloff. And we'll have a man, uh, Ambassador Nisim Tzvili from Israel, who was himself rescued by one of these families. Um, the, so that's another paid program like today. The following week is a free program, and that's a very explosive, controversial film called Who Shall Live and Who Shall Die. It has to do with the United States and whether the United States could have stopped the Holocaust. And uh, it's quite an astounding movie that was made 30 years ago, and it's still very, very fresh. Then we have Thanksgiving. So in early December, we have our last program of the year. And there we are honoring and celebrating modern day heroes, Serge and Beata Klarsfeld, who are famous as Nazi hunters. The most famous living Nazi hunters, Serge and Beata Klarsfeld. But there's so much more than that. They themselves documented the Holocaust in France. They were behind the founding of the Musée de la Shoah in Paris. Um, they continue now in their 80s to be active in speaking out against the rise of extremism in countries around the world. They're very politically active. They're extraordinary people, and you will not want to miss them. They are going to be interviewed for our program by Peter Hellman, who's been working on stories of Holocaust rescue since the 1970s. Fabulous author, Peter Hellman, and we will have the filmmaker. Uh, it's also on that program that you'll be able to buy a season ticket. If you like our programs, you can buy a season ticket for 2024 by choosing the season ticket level for the Klarsfeld program. So you'll have all of that information after today's program. And the last thing I want to mention to you is that we have this book that we are offering about the story of Hans and Margaret Ray, who were rescued by our hero, Aristides de Souza Mendes. And it's the beautiful book on the journey that saved Curious George. And again, you'll have that information. So now let's turn the floor back. Oh, uh, before we turn the floor back, we have a little trailer of our program for next week. So let's play the trailer now. On a hill in Jerusalem, a haunting memorial commemorates the thousands of Jewish communities destroyed in the Holocaust. The names of Europe's lost ghettos are engraved in our memories. But the story of what happened to Jewish communities in Arab lands is largely forgotten. Further up the hill, a tree-shaded garden preserves the names of non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jewish lives. People like Oskar Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg. They are known as the righteous among the nations. But for the writer and historian Robert Satloff, one nation is strangely absent. More than 20,000 non-Jews here recognized for helping, saving Jews during the Holocaust. There's about 60 or so Muslims. Here's uh, Albanians, uh, Bosnians, 
and there's a tree planted up on the hill in memory of the one Turk. Strangely though, out of more than 20,000 names, there's not a single Arab. If Arab Schindlers ever existed, it might change how Arabs view the Holocaust and how Arabs and Jews view each other. This is the story of one man's quest to find an Arab who saved a Jew. Thank you. Shulamit, over to you. Um, I, we learned so much, I hope you will agree with me, from our two uh, speakers. And they, um, and perhaps because we learned so much from them, the number of uh, questions is actually small. They, they seem to have been answered. So you lucky people who have written questions, they will all be addressed, I believe. And the first two questions, one from Sheila Barden and the other one from Joan Kretschmer, concern Yossi. And the question is, Yossi seemed to question whether he was Jewish in the film. He's, he really did. Did he ever come to a conclusion for himself after his visit back to the monastery? Osher, do you have some answer for that? Of course, there was no, no conclusion to the story. Uh, when we first um, talked to the children, each one had a, had a big question for us. One wanted to find his lost sister. The other one is adopting parents from Poland. Everybody had a quest that they needed to finish with us. And unfortunately, it was, I can say it in a cynical uh, tone, there was no happy ending for any of them. There was no happy ending of any of them. And uh, Yossi couldn't, until this day, he doesn't know who he is actually, who his parents were. Uh, I know that uh, they try, they even try genetic uh, tests, and but nothing was found. He's probably not Jewish, but it doesn't really matter because he grew up as, a, as an Israeli. So, and when we traveled around Poland, he used to ask me, do you know how horrible it is not to know who you are? You, who you are? And naively, naively, I said, what do you mean you don't know who you are? I know who you are. You're Yossi. You have wife, children. How, how come you don't know who you are? But then I learned how horrible it is. But I have to tell you something. Um, since Yossi will never know who he is, um, it, it actually came out in the film. The question that he says, um, maybe I'm not Jewish, uh, came out of his mouth with a lot of effort. It was the first time that he dared putting up this question. Mm -hmm. And after we edited the film and screened it for the first time with the Children in Jerusalem Film Festival, we were really anxious about Yossi's reaction to the film. Because when you talk to the camera, you don't always remember what you said. And maybe we used we use him illy. Maybe it was like we took advantage of him and we were really anxious. And when the lights came up, everybody turned to Yossi and said, wow, your story is so emotional. Thank you for telling this story. And for him, it was, in a way, the first time he felt that he was recognized, that people knew him. So he, dis he started, the film was screened commercially in movie theaters. So he used to come incognito, sit in the movie uh -huh. theater and wait until the light would come out and everybody will say, thank you, Yossi. We see you, we recognize you. you. Yes, we know who you are. And Oshra, Oshra, it just, it seems, and, and Naomi, it seems that there's so many ways to heal. Have a film made about you. Sometimes. Have, <laughs> have um, you know, go return to the place of trauma. There are many ways. We just have to know how to use them uh, more effectively. Yossi is a very popular topic of questions. Yeah. He said, 
so I'll just do this briefly by Joan Kretschmer. Joan, are you here, by the way? Um, so what was the result of the separation of Yossi and his friend? You said that was a failure. Yeah. And also, are there other failures? Yeah. Uh, well, um, Isaac's adoption didn't go well. There was no bonding there. And the story of Isaac is really tragic. It's, uh, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but uh, in a short, uh, the, at the beginning, psychologists told this woman to keep um, bringing Isaac to meet with the children. So first, she, uh, his adopting parents used to bring him to friends and then to the kibbutz. But when they saw that it didn't have a good effect on him, and over the years, Isaac couldn't speak to Yossi because Yossi became Israeli, he spoke only Hebrew, and Isaac was an American. They decided to separate them. And the separation did even worse. Oh, God. So Yossi, yeah, and he became a doctor and then a drug addict. And a lot of horrible things happened to him. We met him. And he was such a charming, amazing person and very, very broken. And we told him that the only thing Yossi asked for us, except for trying to know who he was, but he asked us to meet Isaac because he missed him so badly. He felt that his life was missing the main person, the closest person that he ever knew. And he really wanted to meet Isaac again. And he, he begged us to uh, enable it. And Isaac said, I'm, sh I'm really sorry. I know that Yossi wanted to meet. I got a lot of messages over the year, but I'm walking on a thin ice. I'm afraid that if I meet him, I will break down. So I couldn't even give, <clears throat> give Yossi this present, unfortunately. You know, that's, that's one of the beauties, I would say, of psychology. We might understand the large picture and be able to help people but there are always people who cannot. I think about, did, did people here see the film about um, the Eichmann trial? Do you remember what happened in the Eichmann trial? All these people confronted Eichmann and told their stories and felt better for it, but one man fainted. He fainted, he could not do it, he could not speak, and he had to be carried out. So we, we humans are not, the same. And there will be those who, like on a bell curve, those who um, adapt very well and those who can't at all. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. Uh, you then, um, Joan, use the opportunity to say to Noah and me that um, you admire her daughter, Olivia, very much, and that Olivia has not fallen far from the tree. Now, even though that's not a question, I think it's very good to share compliments and make people feel um, accepted and even loved. And here's someone who didn't like something. This is a person, Joseph Levin. Are you there, Joseph? Um, Joseph said that he doesn't like or didn't understand why we emphasized looking Jewish. And then Joseph said, many Jews don't look Jewish. Dana, the sister of Yukek, looks less Jewish than Yossi. Yossi somewhat resembles the famous Israeli singer Ara Einstein. Um, and then she corrects, uh, he corrects himself, not Yukek, but Yulek. So what is this business of whether we look Jewish or not Jewish? What does Jewish look like? My my husband just told me not to wear a Jewish star outside. I'm going to go to a <laughs> rabbi, and I, and he said, "You look Jewish enough. You don't have to add to it." What do you mean? So maybe you've heard that about yourselves. Why do we talk about looking Jewish and not looking Jewish? Well, in the Holocaust, it was a matter of life and death. Simple as that. But Dana so many... could survive. Dana could survive because she could pass as a non-Jewish kid. This is how she survived. She lived in Warsaw with her nanny as a non-Jewish child. They told her, she learned all the prayers. Since she, 
she was blonde and blue eyed, she could survive. That's, that's it. This is the only thing. It was a matter of life and death. And you know what? I'm also a child of survivors. And my mother had dark hair, which mine used to be. And uh, then um, she was trying to survive, obviously. So she put peroxide on her hair, as many Jewish women did. And she pretended that she was not Jewish. And it saved her life. So the fact of looking Jewish can always be disguised. I look very Jewish and I'm proud of it. Okay. It any problem of looking Jewish. It's just the story of the film. Right, right. Um, and then we have a woman I actually know who is on the um, show. And it, her name is Sarah Silberman Schwartz. And she wrote a book of about nine heroines of the Holocaust. and the story of Lena Kuchler Silberman is in there. there. There was another question that didn't get asked having to do with Poland. Why was it so impossible to leave Poland at that time? So it's a history question. Maybe Shulamit can answer. Why was it so difficult after the war to leave Poland? Um, well, the world was divided then, was the beginning of the Cold War. And the communist regime, which was based in Moscow, um, did not give freedom to people to, to do whatever they wanted. And um, they didn't care about the fact that the Jews were subjected to anti-Semitism at that time. So they just kept them there. And uh, it was difficult to leave. Also, you know, you have to always remember, in the process of leaving, you're leaving a place and you're going to a place. Where could these people go? No country, and you know this, was truly hospitable to the Jews during the war. And very few were hospitable to the Jews after the war. Or if they were, it was in small numbers. So the whole business of getting visas, getting the money to go out, getting permission to leave. We all remember the Soviet Jewry plight, right? And they could not leave either. So, And, and then there was a question that wasn't asked, but it's something that really struck me in the film. And that's the story of the Pope and the one woman, one of Lena's children, who was herself rescued by the Pope. So I'm wondering if Oshra can speak more about that. Yeah, this is one of the, it's really a mystery until, until these days. Um, Edith, was one of my favorites. I loved her like maybe a mother or aunt. When she when Edith passed, it was really it broke me up, broke me down. Edith and Max, they were all they all became family to me. But when uh, Edith uh, said that she was rescued by uh, Pope John Paul II, it seemed really weird how she remembered it, how she recognized him, and what really happened there. And um, when John Paul II came to Israel, we didn't even start shooting the film. We were already, we were still in pre-production. We didn't have any money. So we had to go and find a camera somewhere and the uh, recording material. And we had to shoot a meeting between Edith and the Pope. So first we had to find an archbishop who will put her uh, there so she can meet the Pope. And she, we had to write uh, letters and we had to plea for them to accept it. It wasn't very easy to do it. And we put a mic on Edith. And all the other journalists that covered uh, the, the visit of John Paul II at Yad Vashem, they didn't use uh, recording materials. Only we had recording. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on Edith, a mic on Edith. So later on, all the TV station, everybody wanted our footage because it had sound on it. And uh, Edith says to the Pope, thank you for saving me. You saved me when I was a little child and you took me on your back in the snow. And she tells the story to the Pope. And the Pope said, thank you that you remember it. Nice that you remember it. 
but he never says, he says, he never really said, yes, I did it. It wasn't really, it was, it was never obvious. Later on, she was invited every year to the Vatican. They would wow. buy the tickets. She became a Christian celebrity. Uh, all the Christian uh, Catholic papers in Italy and uh, in other countries, everybody wrote this uh, story. And we asked the Archbishop of Jerusalem, why didn't the Pope say, yes, it's true, I did it? Why he never acknowledged it? And he said that it's it's really like the sin of a, of a hubris. He would never say such a thing. It's it's a huge sin for Christians to say yes, we are heroes, yet we save people, but we believe it was true. So it was one of the questions that remained a little bit open, and each one of you is allowed to think what you think. That's wow. beautiful. We are now coming towards the end of our program, unfortunately. And um, what we do in these programs is we have a final thought. I'm going to switch the order a little bit and have Noemi go first because you have just given us so much, Osha, maybe you want to think for a second. So Noemi, what is your final thought? Trigger warning. My final thoughts are a downer. You may choose to mute me. Like most of you, I am in an ocean of pain. I feel horror at what Hamas did. I also feel sadness and some shame that the response requires the murder of so many innocents. Lena took the children to Israel in 1949. Their escape from communist Poland was a heroic feat. In 1949, Israel offered the hope that Jews could finally live free in their own country, safe from anti-Semitism. In 1949, my mother sent the orphan children from Belgium to Israel. The Nazis had wanted to destroy the Jewish seed, and in Israel, the children would truly survive as Jews. 1949 is when I first traveled to Israel. I was 12 years old. I traveled alone to visit family and spend time in a kibbutz. It was exhilarating. The last months, I seen the dream turn into a nightmare. Antisemitism is once again raging all around the world. Many children have been killed in Israel and in Gaza. Many more are traumatized and the trajectory of their lives has been forever impacted. They cannot even begin to heal. Healing from terror requires that one feel safe now. Many will replace their fear with rage. There are not enough leaners to help them straighten their past. I was a child during the Holocaust and have now come full circle back to the darkness in my old age. Jews are resilient. We have been in survival mode before, and we have had periods when we flourished. We will again. I am 87 and will probably not see it, but I hope that my grandchildren and great-grandchildren will. Ashra, please say whatever you would like to say to our audience in closing. I'm I feel it really, I find it really hard to speak after what Noemi said. Uh, yes, we are going through something so horrible. Um, for all of us, somehow, Lena, Lena used to say that um, in Hebrew, it's, uh, I don't know if I, if I can translate it into uh, English. Um, um, 
Let me try to help you. Two words for survivors. So it's uh, it's like all of us. It's maybe I can say it this way: they are survivors of the Holocaust, and all of us have escaped the Holocaust. Like all of us have escaped the Holocaust. Everyone who is alive in Israel, she said, have escaped the Holocaust. It means that somehow the Holocaust is uh, uh, threatened all of us, even the younger generation, even I am. Uh, I who was born in 1957, like Shira, Elena's daughter, um, have escaped somehow the Holocaust. But they are the survivors themselves, the people who were there. Well, they are the survivors. And as people, as a generation who grew up under the threat of, of the Holocaust, this is what was at the background of the establishing of the of Israel, and the, it was there always. We wanted to, um, we wanted to uh, take take ourselves out of this shadow. Each time Netanyahu Netanyahu would say, "Yes, we remember the Holocaust." I wanted to punch him in the nose, and say, "No, I'm not go. I'm not." living by the Holocaust. The Holocaust is not my, the torch that showed, shows me the light. I want to be a moral person. I want to be a normal person. I want to build and not to escape anything. I don't want to feel hated everywhere. I don't want to think to have this notion that everyone hates the Jews. And whenever uh, I heard criticism about my country, I would say, yes, it's not anti-Semitism. It's just criticism about the politics of my country. And I agree with it. I have a lot of criticism towards the politics of my country. But the first time in my life, and I'm six, almost 67, I do see anti-Semitism rise clearly. And I live in Israel. <laughs> I don't have to face it, but I need to face it. It's the first time that I realized that it's very, sometimes it's very hard to separate criticism from anti-Semitism. And for me, it's horrifying. And I think that luckily, Lena didn't have to see it because she was so optimistic. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some of the people who still who are still alive, like Yossi, do have to see it. And for me, it's heartbreaking. Tell me. No, I mean. I'll just say one thing on this topic. I agree with both of you in your appreciation for one another. That's so lovely to see. Um, I am, I think I mentioned a child of survivors and I just finished writing a book about my father's experience in the war. And my father- um, oh, I'm sorry, I have, there uh, is an alarm, I have to go out. Okay, I have to... be safe, be safe. My father wrote in, uh, I don't know when he wrote this exactly, let's say 1980, he had been in the United States since 1947. He wrote, another Holocaust is inevitable. And when I wrote his book, I didn't know if I want to write that sentence. I didn't know if it was inevitable, and I thought this is a not a great thought to put in there. But now I'm beginning to learn that idea too. And if it is inevitable, then we as Jews have a task to figure out how to escape, how to uh, fight against it, how to recognize uh, reality, we have a job. And our learning about people like Lena and our learning about all the other people that Olivia brought to our attention shows us how some people coped with it and they can really be our role models. So it has a new enhanced meaning for me to uh, have the honor of moderating this session. Gosh. Uh, 
it's hard to even conclude such a session, but uh, obviously all of us have been impacted by what just happened in the last hour, what's happening in the world today, and by Osho's movie. So um, all I can do is express my thanks to our speakers, our moderator, and our wonderful audience. See you again next week and in the weeks to come. We care about you. Be well, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye. Um.